if you got the cards in the wrong order or if a card got jammed in the card reader, uh, it was a nightmare to try to uh, fix uh, a resolve. Uh, but that's how computing was done uh, for a number of years until the 80s or so. Um, beyond that, what we're now much more familiar with uh, are the computer interface where you have uh, people that are uh, interacting with a computer by typing out instructions on a keyboard. Uh, the instructions may be to run a program, uh, they may be to create a program, um, but that's how uh, we're most uh, accustomed to uh, interacting with computers. But we've actually come a long way even beyond that. What is available to consumers today are computing products uh, like this one, uh, where you have computers that are actually watching humans. Uh, they're watching the gestures that people do. Uh, what's seen here is a video game where uh, the players are immersed in an experience where a computer is watching them and interpreting the gestures that they make uh, and responding to those gestures by changing uh, the position and the activities of the actors that are part of that game. For the humans that are participating in that kind of uh, computing interaction, uh, they are inside of that experience because there's not as uh, rigid an interface uh, between them and the computer. It's very fluid. The computer's watching them and responding to what they do. Very recently, in fact, earlier this month, uh, Facebook uh, released this technology that uh, supports image object recognition. Uh, so from having computers that can watch the movement of humans to having uh, AI systems that can look at still images and interpret what is in those pictures is actually a very a big deal. It's a big advancement in uh, the human computer interface. Uh, this is actually something that at a keynote uh, that was given the last keynote of Closure West last year uh, that was given by uh, Melanie Mitchell. Uh, I'm a giant fanboy of uh, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, what she described, uh, which has been the sort of focus of her work um, after getting her PhD, has been research into training AI systems to interpret images and to try to figure out uh, what is depicted in those. And it turns out it's actually a really, really hard problem. Uh, and there are all kinds of things that the human brain does very fluidly uh, that we sort of take for granted. We don't even realize uh, how many things that our brain has to get through in order for us to recognize what it is that we see or that we hear. And teaching computers how to do that turns out to be actually pretty tricky. Uh, so Having computers watch us and respond to us and even interpret what it is that they see is a big advancement in computing. Uh, so that's, that's one of the senses. Uh, another sense is the sense of hearing. So what I think probably a lot of us in the room, uh, myself included, have in our pockets uh, are computer systems that you can just talk to. Uh, so there's a feature that was released in iOS that allows you to just express, uh, hey Siri, Actually, I probably shouldn't say that my phone's going to go off, or maybe all of our phones are going to go off. <laughs> Where you can just uh, address the computer, and it just happens to be listening to you. And actually, I feel my phone buzzing right now. Um, it's listening to you, and you can ask it questions. Uh, you can ask it to do things. You can request some sort of action, and it'll get back to you. Uh, what we're going to find uh, over the next however many years is that those kinds of interfaces to computers become much more common because they're easier. It doesn't require us to touch something. All we do is just emote something. Maybe we move around and the computer looks at us or listens to us. That's really, really handy. But the technology that makes this work uh, turns out actually to be pretty hard. Uh, what our brains do in interpreting language is uh, a combination of pattern recognition and context. And the context is really important because context matters with what you're saying. So let's say, for example, I were to say uh, to my computer, the computer that's just listening to me, if I were to say, where can I uh, get a steak? So if the problem I'm trying to solve is that I want to kill a vampire, really the question I'm asking is, uh, where's the closest hardware store? Uh, but I can ask a question that sounds very similar where I say, where can I uh, get a steak? And in that context, really what I'm asking is, uh, where's the closest steakhouse? So I'm having a conversation with my computer, and my context is I'm hungry. And I ask it, where can I get a steak? And it says, well, the closest steakhouse is whatever. Uh, but what if I follow up that question with, uh, what about Mexican? So what about Mexican 
is relevant because of the question that I already asked. If I'm talking to a person and having a conversation with a person, they're going to get that because we're used to having those sorts of multi-point conversations. Uh, having that work with a computer so that you can just talk to a computer in the same way that you talk to a human uh, is something that we are approaching. And in fact, uh, that's something that Amazon has uh, come into with a product that they released last year that's called the Echo. So the Echo is this uh, 2001-esque kind of monolith uh, that uh, Jeff Bezos would like, to, like you to have in your living space somewhere. Uh, the Echo is a device that you address by calling it by its human name, uh, Alexa. So when you interact with an Echo, you preface that interaction by calling it by a human name and then expressing some kind of a request. You might say, Alexa, what time is it? Or Alexa, what's the weather going to be like today? You can also have a conversational interaction with Alexa where you might say, uh, Alexa, uh, what movies are playing uh, in theaters tonight? And it may read through the movies. And then you might follow that up with, uh, what are the show times for one of those? Having that kind of conversational interaction is normal for us because, like I said before, that's just what we do. And systems like the uh, Alexa platform that's part of Echo uh, bring those things to us in a way that people are going to become really accustomed to. So Amazon released the ability to do, to use the same thing that the Echo uh, device runs on top of as a service. And it's a service that's called the Alexa, the Alexa service. And Alexa is actually made up of two different uh, big components. Uh, one of those is called uh, the Alexa Skills Kit. So the Alexa Skills Kit is a series of APIs that you can use for bringing um, a voice interface to your application. Uh, the Alexa Skills Kit includes uh, ways to do just single interactions where you express some question and you get a response to that, uh, but it also supports having conversational interactions where you start with one uh, interaction and then you ask uh, more and more questions uh, that follow up contextually to wherever it is that you started. And they may lead anywhere. Um, the interactions can be stateful, so you're going to carry along, uh, and it's up to the developers of the, that, uh, that voice interaction. It's up to them to recognize what it is that they want to uh, go from one step to the next in the interaction, but it's possible. And the Alexa Skills Kit exposes that through an API. <laughs> Another part of the Alexa platform is Alexa Voice Services. And Alexa Voice Services is uh, a way for you to register a device or an application uh, that can run on top of Alexa. Uh, and what Amazon would like is for you to have that be part of the Echo platform. Uh, so what I want to do is uh, demonstrate that. So coming to this conference, I was thinking about uh, giving this talk, and I was thinking about how I could demonstrate <laughs> Uh, what it is that's possible with this kind of uh, voice interface. So uh, being a good closure developer, I thought about data. And what kind of questions would I like to ask uh, the data that's relevant to a conference? So what I did was uh, I wrote uh, something that scrapes the schedule for the conference uh, and put that into a data source and then uh, created a skill that reads that data source and can respond to interactions of me asking the schedule data for this conference, uh, a few questions, and then interacting with that and seeing where it goes. Uh, so I'm going ahead and go ahead and play that. Uh, I would do a live demonstration, but it depends on conference Wi-Fi, which is usually pretty dicey. Uh, but this is a fair representation of uh, what's capable for what I wrote for this talk. Oh, wait a second. Actually, hang on a second. Let me. Unfortunately, I forgot to do an audio thing, so you probably can't hear it very well. Here we go. Open Dragonfly. Question mark. What time is my talk? Your talk is on Friday from 1.50 to 2.30 p.m. The other talks scheduled at the same time as yours are Parallel Programming, Fork, Join, and Reducers by Daniel Hickenbottom and Building a Legal Data Service with Clojure by Jonathan Boston and Caleb Phillips. 
read me the abstract for that first talk. If you don't know your work, span from your fork, join. This talk is for you. By attending this introduction to Thinking Parallel, you learn why parallel programming matters, how to think about performance, and how to tackle real-world concerns. You'll learn about how the fork, join framework embodies best practices. And of course, you'll learn how Clojure implements these ideas with reducers. Uh, so that took... Um, really a few, oh, oh thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much. It was actually, really wasn't all that hard to do, and I'll show you why in a second, uh, but I want to go into what it is that we actually heard there. Um, so the Alexa Skills Kit has these two different concepts uh, that are related to how you uh, declare the interactions that you want to be able to support from your skill. Uh, so those two concepts are intents and slots. So an intent is, uh, basically represents a kind of interaction that has a specific goal. And slots are ways for you to uh, declare parameters that a particular kind of interaction needs. So for example, this is an intent that's called get horoscope. Uh, get horoscope is an intent that has two slots. And the slots are uh, sign and date. Uh, slots are typed. So the type of the slot, uh, type of the sign slot is list of slots. And uh, list of slots is probably just a list of the uh, 12 zodiac signs. Uh, date is a type called Amazon date, and I'll go into those in a second. Uh, but the idea is that when you declare this intent, you're saying that when it's invoked, uh, what needs to be supplied are uh, a sign uh, that matches list of signs and some date that is of type Amazon date. Um, so you might say, uh, what is the horoscope for a cancer today? Um, or what is a horoscope for a cancer on July 6th, which is my birthday, uh, which is the birthday of cancers? Um, so that's how you would do it. And what the Alexa platform does is that it listens uh, to what you've said, and uh, based on the definition of your intent, it translates the components that are part of uh, that it's called an utterance, and I'll go into utterances in a second. Uh, but it translates them and then passes the data into uh, your code uh, so that you can read those parameters and then respond appropriately. I'll go into that in a second. Uh, so the built-in slots that Amazon provides uh, are these. So you might have a date, and the example of date is today, tomorrow, um, July, something like that. Uh, duration, uh, which is something that could be a series of minutes, like five minutes, for example. And that gets translated into a format when it's passed into your code uh, so that you can understand what it is uh, that was intended in the expression. Um, other data types are four-digit numbers, which are useful for years, uh, numbers, uh, time, like four in the morning, something that is just sort of colloquial. Uh, those things get translated uh, based on those data types. Uh, US cities, common first names, uh, states, all these data types are ones that you could actually extend. They may not have uh, all of what you need in whatever the type of data type is, but Am the Alexa platform allows you to uh, extend the definition of those things so that you can uh, make it sort of closer to what it is that you're going for. You can also uh, create your own custom uh, data types, uh, which is something that we saw before in the, the list of horoscopes. Uh, so these are the intents that were part of the demonstration that I showed. One of those intents was Mario's schedule intent. Uh, so when I said, uh, what time is my talk, uh, that invoked code that looked for my specific talk. Um, Mario's talk competition is what other talks are happening at the same time as mine. So that's actually what you're missing in the two rooms uh, next to us. Um, then uh, read relative abstract. So I asked, uh, read me the abstract for that first talk. So that was the first talk of those two that it mentioned. Um, and the slot for that was uh, order. Uh, and order could be an order phrase. Uh, so order phrase may be first, second, third, et cetera. Um, but the point of that interaction is that you specify which of a set is the one that you would like to uh, read the abstract for. And that's contextually relative to uh, the previous question of what, ta what talks are also happening at the same time as mine. So, that's how you define the intents for a skill. And you can have many intents for a particular skill. Uh, the other component that's part of defining uh, an intent and an interaction uh, are utterances. 
So utterances are example phrases uh, that are part of, they're the, the expressions that should trigger the intent that you've declared with Amazon. So uh, those, the way that uh, Alexa works with those utterances is that it tries to find a, a high confidence match uh, that ties what you've said with a declared uh, intent for your skill so that uh, it can be confident in triggering that skill. If it doesn't get a high enough match uh, based on what you've said uh, compared to the utterances that have been uh, registered for a particular intent, uh, it, what it'll do is do what's called a reprompt. And a reprompt is an opportunity for you as a programmer to provide a contextual question to help the user of your service uh, ask uh, or, I'm sorry, express what their need is a little bit better. And hopefully it'll be closer to the utterances that you have declared for your interaction. So here are some examples. So what I had to come up with when I was uh, designing those intents were how I might express uh, the things I would say to get across that I want to know when my talk is. So when is my talk? What time is my talk? So those are uh, two ways that I might say um, that I might trigger the uh, the functionality to find out when my talk is, when Mario Aquino's talk is. Uh, Mario's talk competition. So what talks are happening at the same time as mine? What talks are happening at the same time? What about other talks at the same time? So those are all, they're close, right? They're close to each other. And, and generally, there are many ways to express the same kind of a request, the same kind of question. There are lots of ways that you can express that. And one of the things that I found a little bit awkward about uh, defining the intents uh, for these interactions was thinking through uh, the different uh, utterances and trying to come up with as complete a list as I could. So what I used to uh, create this voice interface uh, was a library that we created at a company where I work uh, that we call Boomhour. So Boomhour is a uh, really bare bones closure library uh, that exposes an easy way to register uh, intents um, in Clojure uh, that you can deploy either uh, to M AWS Lambda, which is what I did for this demonstration, uh, or uh, some other way. And I can go into that in a second. Um, but the, uh, the library is uh, really pretty minimalistic. Uh, but what it does is uh, it, it makes it very easy to create these kinds of voice interfaces. So I want to look at a little bit of the code that, was, um, that shows really how easy it could be. So uh, this is some code right here uh, for a very simple interaction uh, that's uh, the schedule intent interaction. Uh, so the way this works is that down at the bottom where it says def intent, so that's a macro that's part of the Boomhour library, that what you do is you specify the name of the intent, and that's an intent that you've registered with Amazon, uh, along with the function that needs to be invoked when that intent gets triggered. Uh, so uh, this one, schedule intent, should, be, should trigger the browse talks function and browse talks gets two parameters, and this is what the, the Boomer library provides. The first of those two parameters is the session. So the session is uh, Amazon's, uh, I'm sorry, Alexa's uh, session uh, object, and the session object gives you, the programmer, the ability to uh, set state from one interaction to the next that you want to have accumulate in the interactions. Now, if you just have an interaction that's just a, a one-off where you just express something and you're given the answer, and that ends the interaction, there's really no need to follow up, uh, then what you do is you pass back what's called a tell response. And in a tell response, uh, you turn whatever text that you want to have the Alexa voice read back to the client, uh, you pass that in a tell response, uh, your code goes back to Alexa, which turns the content into a voice, an audio file, and that gets sent back to the client, and that's what the user hears. Um, and so this is, this is like, this is it. It's really, really simple and straightforward. Uh, another example uh, is a different interaction. So this is uh, my schedule intent where I want to get my time. Uh, so in get my time, again, I get uh, a session object. Oh, I forgot to, ex uh, to explain the session map. So the session object is where you accumulate state. The session map uh, is what has the value of the parameters, if there are any, that uh, were part of that interaction. So where you can say that a particular kind of uh, utterance takes a series of parameters, those things are going to be in the session map. And you can pull those out of there and um, process them uh, however is appropriate, and then build the response uh, based on what it is that the interaction is supposed to do. 
uh, build that response and then send that back to Alexa, and Alexa will pass it on to the client. Um, and uh, so all that is made uh, pretty easy uh, with Boom Hour. Uh, if you're interested in trying this out, I'd really recommend uh, giving it a shot. Uh, what I found, uh, what I was able to do just for that demonstration was just a couple of days worth of work. So uh, in terms of running the stack, uh, so running the stack is something you've got a couple of different options for. Uh, the way that I deployed this was on top of uh, AWS Lambda. Uh, Boom Hour is, uh, facilitates that. Uh, and that was uh, just really easy and it's also cheap. And I don't know if it really there's much cost at all to what it was that I was able to get working. But if you don't want to deploy to AWS, let's say that your uh, deployment environment is something where you've got your own servers, uh, the Alexa Skills Kit uh, can support that too. The documentation for the Alexa Skills Kit, it defines the interactions, the requests and the responses that are part of each intent invocation. And uh, it's really clearly defined so you know basically what to expect when Amazon calls your service, your, the endpoint that you register, um, you know what to expect with what's going to get passed to you and then what will get returned. Boom Hour is something that's written for uh, writing a closure app that you want to deploy to Lambda. So you, you wouldn't use Boom Hour for that, uh, but the Alexa Skills Kit uh, is open to uh, implementing whatever it is that you want to do uh, in many different um, technologies, whether it's something on the JVM or other ones. Um, so at least for this one, uh, I deployed it to AWS Lambda. Um, Lambda also requires specifying uh, a couple of different policies, a role policy and an execution policy. And basically what those things do is they define uh, what, who is allowed to call your function and what your function is allowed to do when it runs, what maybe other AWS services is allowed to, do, to interact with um, and that's just part of the, the IAM uh, uh, library, uh, service, I'm sorry, that's part of uh, AWS. So um, in addition to that, uh, deploying the code, I had to install uh, AWS CLI and uh, create an Uber jar that has my code and uh, whatever dependencies my code may have. And when I deploy that, um, I send the Uber jar and the policies and the, the name of the skill uh, that I'm sending code up to uh, up to Amazon and it takes you know, a minute or two to get up there and then uh, once that's done, then I've got, a, uh, I've got something that can respond to a voice interface. Uh, in addition to that, Amazon also provides uh, some, some things that are convenient for doing local development. Um, what I showed in that demonstration was this Java GUI that uh, has a button that you can press for um, having it listen to you and it listens to whatever you say uh, it'll turn what you say into uh, an audio format that it will then send up to Amazon, and then Amazon, I'm sorry, Alexa will uh, invoke whatever, wherever it is that your service is running uh, that responds to a skill invocation. Uh, there's also a node server that's sort of part of it behind the scenes, but anyway, there are easy ways to do local uh, development when you're trying to work on your skill, and these are more or less the things that are involved. So um, what I found in thinking through uh, using the Alexa platform and uh, doing this development was that um, mobile seems like a great place to target the voice interface. And I think that Alexa could be a real game changer uh, for mobile apps because uh, it provides a new way to interact with a mobile application. What we're all used to is you know, tapping on our devices um, because they're, they're touch devices and there's a visual component to them too. Uh, but having yet another way to interact, to talk to your data, uh, if you've got a data-rich uh, domain or data-rich application, that could be a real game changer. And I think that that's something that uh, we will see happen more often uh, in time. And I think the Alexa platform is one way to do that. Um, but we're not quite there yet, and I'll go into that a bit more in a minute. What I also want to talk about are the hard bits. So as I was working out the, uh, the sample application, the things that I found kind of hard and a little bit awkward, I mentioned already, uh, the utterances, thinking through all the ways that I might try to express something um, and having to basically provide all of those to Amazon. That was, um, it was a little bit hard to think of all of those. And I also found it clumsy because there are lots of phrases that are sort of similar to each other. And um, the similarity of that I found kind of annoying. What I would rather do is express a grammar, a grammar that matches ways that you might express some kind of an intent and have a tool generate the utterances and then provide that to Alexa. 
Right now, that's not part of the Alexa platform. I feel like it'll probably come. However, there are some, so other people have thought of this too, and it turns out that there are actually some libraries that people have written uh, that allow you to use a grammar, uh, to use a grammar using some technology uh, that you can use for generating these utterances. And using that would make it easier to satisfy all the utterances that you want to provide for your interaction. Another thing that's hard for the human ear, that's also sometimes hard for Alexa, is uh, words that are not part of the sort of normal lexicon that we use in regular communication. If, you, if there are words that are part of your domain that are um, either just uncommon or may even be hard to hear, or I'm sorry, hard to say, like I don't know if anybody noticed, but when Alexa was reading the abstract for one of the other talks, it kept saying closure instead of closure. Um, and that sort of subtlety is something that uh, is not uncommon if, d if the words of your domain are sort of subtle like that. Uh, if I were to have it say uh, a soch or a soak or a sos, I'm not sure where it would land, but I feel like it would probably be the, that, that would be the conclusive definition and we could all like stop fighting about it. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, so a accents, so just like the human ear has to sort of train itself for recognizing accents, that's something that uh, the Alexa voice service uh, can have some trouble with. Uh, as well, there is a certification process. So when you want to publish your skill, uh, you have to send it through the certification process that uh, some component of the Alexa team has to go through and make sure either that your skill is easy to use uh, or there are sufficient number of phrases to trigger uh, the interactions that you want to be able to pr provide through a voice interface. Uh, and you may go through a number of different uh, cycles of uh, submitting your application for certification and having uh, the Amazon team reject it and having to go through it over and over again. If you've ever submitted an app to uh, Apple's App Store, uh, you may be familiar with this kind of a cycle. It can be very frustrating, uh, but that's the way it is right now. And the reason for that is that Amazon really wants to try to provide a, a platform uh, where people don't get frustrated by using uh, the Amazon Echo. So in terms of my experience from using this, there were a few things that I wish were different, and I want to go over those. So. Right now, Amazon's main interest is the Echo. I actually bought one uh, very recently uh, just from working with this. When I was doing the development for this, I didn't have an Echo. I, I actually just used the GUI client that can listen to me and then um, sends the, the, uh, the voice interactions up to uh, Amazon. And that was just fine enough for doing development. Uh, but Amazon's real main interest is uh, the Echo. Uh, they want people to have Echoes and then to have an ecosystem, ecosystem. There's, I mean, the, the punniness of this whole thing is, I mean, there's, there's, there's tons of material there. Anyway, uh, Amazon's real focus is uh, having people um, buy these, this device uh, that they can have in their living space and um, order Amazon products, because they're in business to make a lot of money, uh, but also integrate with uh, service providers, other service providers that they can access uh, to do business with through this uh, product in the same way that uh, on mobile devices, uh, Android devices or uh, iOS devices, that there is a great ecosystem of ways to spend money, to use services, et cetera. Uh, Amazon is trying to start up something like this um, right now. And I think that's a little bit unfortunate because the technology of the Alexa voice service is something that is broader than just using it with an Echo, even though I have one. Um, I'm not employed by Amazon. Um, also. Uh, there's not really an easy way for you to piggyback onto the interactions between the user and your service. So let's say that I have a mobile application that I want to expose a, uh, a voice interface to, and in that voice interaction, I want to be able to pass back to the client some extra information uh, that goes in addition to what uh, Alexa, is, the Alexa voice is going to say to them in response to whatever request they've sent. So let's say, for example, uh, I've got a, a data-rich application that uh, I asked some question on, and Amazon, I'm sorry, Alexa starts reading back a long list of things that are part of the answer to my question. It would be great if, uh, in that response, I could also tell the client application, by the way, show this graph or show this something while the user is hearing uh, the, the auditory response to whatever their question was. That would be great, and there's not really a way to do that today. Um, and I hope that something like that comes because that would really 
uh, be a, a boost to the capabilities of having a voice interface. Uh, also, something that's actually not specific to, uh, a, to Alexa is the JVM startup time. Um, if you're deploying uh, a JVM to Lambda, uh, there's a second or two that you have to wait to warm up the, uh, the Lambda instance, wherever it is inside of the Amazon Cloud, and that detracts from the user interface slightly. Uh, if you're deploying with Python or uh, Node.js JavaScript, um, you don't have to pay that same thing, but this is a closure conference and don't do that. Um, so another thing that is actually, I think really the biggest thing that I wish was different uh, was this. So when you uh, provide a voice interface, what you also have to do is provide to the user, especially if you're trying to do some sort of user linking. So let, let's say that I'm a bank and uh, in my banking application, I want to expose a voice interface so that uh, a customer can say a uh, question like, um, how much money have I spent in the last month at bars? Uh, let's say I go out a lot socially. Um, in order to do that, what you have to do is tie the account uh, of the bank customer with uh, an account that that same human customer has with Amazon, which is a big downside. So right now, if you try to add a skill that ties uh, your, uh, your organization's user account to using a voice service, the user is going to be prompted with a dialogue that has to say, OK, I am so-and-so, and I do want to provide access to the service. And that totally sucks. It sucks because I use Amazon Web Services for my whatever. It doesn't matter what my business is, but whoever uses my business they shouldn't care that I'm deployed to uh, AWS. That has nothing at all to do with the service that I provide, but in uh, tying the account that I have with my users, uh, Amazon requires that we go through a user linking step um, that provides the user with a dialogue that lets them know uh, that they're using this Amazon uh, voice service, which is a big negative. Um, and I wish that was really, I wish that was different because that would make adding a voice service completely transparent, which is what I want. I would make my application so much more awesome. So in working through this um, having a voice interface, I started to take a step back and um, ask myself, where are we going? So we have computers that can watch us and respond to our movements. And that's something that um, consumers uh, have had for a few years, and it's not jarring, right, having computers watch us. In 2001, uh, HAL, uh, HAL 9000, is that what it was called? Uh, that computer turned out to be um, you know, psychopathic and tried to kill the people on the spaceship. And uh, so that should give us pause, right? But when the Kinect watches us sort of dance around, it's like, oh, yeah, cool. I can have a thing that dances. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> so having computers uh, watch us, um, that's something that is uh, that's very useful uh, but there's a lot more that's going on right now. And in terms of where we're going, we have cars that can uh, drive as automatons. We can get inside them and tell them where we want to go and read our morning paper, drink our coffee. And we're teaching computers to do things that normally humans have done so that we can do something else. And one view of why we're doing this and not so much why, but where we might be going, uh, dystopian view, uh, was in a movie called uh, WALL-E, where humans were sort of relegated to an existence where caretakers had to uh, afford them all the things that they needed so that they could just not have to do anything at all. I don't really think that that's where we're going, though. What I think of is when I go back and think about my Richard Dawkins, what I remember is that genes, according to Dawkins, are these immortal entities. And the whole point of genes is to recreate themselves. What genes do is they try to make a copy of themselves from one generation to the next, a perfect copy, ideally. When I think about where we are going, humanity is going, by creating computers that can do things that humans can do, that can watch us, that can listen to us, that can move around, that can interact, eventually it's going to be the point where they can think for themselves this is what life does. Life recreates itself. Uh, the why is, I don't know that there really needs to be a why, but that's just what life does. I think that's where we're going. Um, the more that we have computers that are much more like us, 
I think the reason for that is because that's just what life does. So that's what I have. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, I think we have just a few minutes for questions. I have about two and a half minutes for questions, and after that we've got a break and we can continue talking afterwards. Go ahead. So the, the question is, can you do something that has a side effect um, when you invoke a skill? Uh, yeah, you can have a side effect that launches all the missiles, if you like. Um, <laughs> because really, it's just another way to trigger code in a computer uh, that happened to be triggered by somebody saying, launch all the missiles or order me a sandwich. Uh, there was a hand back there first. Do you see any difference between this technology and chatbots? And chatbots? Um, I'm not an expert in chatbots. Oh, I, I, that's, that's right, the Tay, right? So the, the Tay was this thing that uh, probably a lot of computer scientists thought long and hard about, and they had really grand expectations for this thing, and in like a day it turned into like a porn drug sex bot, um, <laughs> racist sex bot. Uh, it's really unfortunate. Um, but uh, the way to interact with that AI was just through text. Uh, but it was really just a program that was responding to some input. Uh, and you can interact with programs either with your voice or by moving around or by sending it whatever things through Twitter. Um, uh, just another variation. Uh, uh, you, sorry. Uh, so as far as the utterances, there's like, you know, it's just completely strictly exactly the string you pass in has to match whatever it parses the text to, or is there any kind of leeway there at all? Good question. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a precise match. Uh, what uh, Alexa tries to do is have a confidence, a high enough confidence that the, the series of word tokens that you passed in your utterance is close enough uh, with a high enough confidence that it's going to trigger something. And if it can't get that high confidence, uh, it provides a mechanism for the, the skill to reprompt the user to try to get better information. Uh, typically, I think those reprompts happen more when the sort of parametric values that you're going to pass into a skill uh, when the value of that isn't exactly clear and you want to give the user another chance to say it again. Maybe they mumbled, maybe they've got an accent, maybe they forgot to do something. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just wondering how flexible it is. Like, if you change a conjugation or uh, drop a word, like, how flexible would it be to do it testing how flexible that is? Or... Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. It's hard for me to say exactly how flexible. Um, if anybody in the room has a better answer to that, I'd like to hear it. Right. Um, so, uh, Boomer potentially could be something that uh, is sort of a broader DSL for registering voice interfaces. Uh, at the moment, I'm not familiar enough with other, <clears throat> excuse me, other uh, natural language processing as a service services to say um, where we could sort of change it and adapt it for other ones. Uh, but that sounds really good to me. Uh, the library itself is really in a nascent stage, um, but it makes what I did really easy, and I'd like to. I think all, all of us uh, that worked on it would like it to, to improve. Uh, so if you've got some uh, natural language processing service uh, that you're aware of, um, I, I'd like to hear more about that and maybe we could look at it more seriously. Okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, I think we've got like a half hour break. Here. <laughs>